Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, coming together during lunchtime. Uh, I see nobody's eating, so that's wow, this is really serious stuff. Which is awesome. Uh, first, uh, I'm Christopher Lee. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm asked to host or moderate this session. Uh, just to let everybody know, uh, please, I will not be able to answer any questions with regards to policies on the Ministry of Health because I've just retired. Uh, but today's uh, objective uh, of this meeting is to look at uh, how patients with COVID-19 can be better managed. And with us, uh, of course, is our intensivist uh, from Hospital Sungai Bulo and Hospital Kuala Lumpur. I think she covers a lot of places. Uh, Dr. Shanti Bhuta Devi, uh, we all know her very well. Uh, so she will be uh, giving a presentation first. Um, and uh, later on, uh, both Dr. Shanti and Dr. Giri Shan from Kota Kinabalu uh, will join us as panelists to uh, address some of your questions and, and issues. Uh, so, without further ado, I think it's okay. Uh, as Dr. Shanti is speaking, we need everyone to mute your microphones. Uh, but make sure you know when it's on, because if you say bad things about me, I can hear you. So, uh, uh, I have to remind myself first. Alright, so without further ado, Shanti, you have the floor. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the introduction. All right, today I'll be talking about two cases. I'm going to be discussing the cases uh, that were in the intensive care unit here in Sungai Uh One patient was ventilated and the other was the site of the mask. And I'll start off with the first case. Right. The first case is a woman with late disease, the hypertensive dyslipidemia, but however not on regular treatment. He came in on the 15th of March with a history of fever for one week, with red, cough, and sore throat. This is his, his uh, so basically he came in on the 9th. Uh, he was symptomatic on the, on the 9th of March and he was admitted on the 15th of March. This is his chest x ray when he came in on the 9th of March. Uh, sorry, on the 15th. Okay, anyway, he was in, in ICU, he was put on non-humidified oxygen, 10 liters per minute via high flow mass. He remained stable in ICU, however, and afibrile, but was extremely tachypneic with the respiratory rate ranging from 30 to 35 breaths per minute till about day 5 of uh, ICU. Saturation was at that time ranged from 90 to 97%. He was put on Teletra and Interferon. His input and output was closely monitored, ensuring an even balance. Small boluses of Fusumide were given intermittently to maintain that even balance. Day 6 of ICU, he became less tachypneic. His respirate was down to 22 to 26, but he had a spike of temperature. Cultures were taken, and he was empirically put on tazosin to cover for a possible nosocomial pneumonia. The cathet urinary catheter was then removed, and uh, his chest x-ray did not show new infiltrate, and he was discharged for the day 8 of ICU. So this is his progress in, in the ICU. In day one, when he came into the ED, he, he, he was febrile. He, he was fairly stable, a little tachycardic, but his weight, respiratory rate was about 35, saturating at about 92 on, uh, on, on five liters of fluid. Then he was referred to us for the kidney. Remained fairly stable, as you can see from here, hemodynamically, but he was very tachypneic, all right, till about day five of ICU. And about day six when he settled. The saturation, his saturation was anywhere between 92, 89 at times, and only at day six it went up to about 96, 97. So this is his chest x-ray in ICU when he was admitted here, showing bilateral lung infiltrate. This was on day four on ICU, right, when, when the infiltrate started to sort of dissolve. Day six of ICU when he had a new form of, of uh, infection, and uh, you can see the X-ray actually clearing. So we didn't think he, his new bout of uh, temperature spike was due to a, uh, a lung infection. Um, so, so throughout his stay, his, his fluid was maintained, really kept him even balance. It was only on Teletra and Interferon, except at day six when he had the new spike of temperature when he was on Tyson charged back to the ward on, on day, day 
nine of the day. This uh, renal function remained normal despite him being tightly controlled the fluid. White cells also did not follow. So, so look at what we can learn from this case. What are the indications for early ICU referral? I think this is really important. One is acute respiratory distress. Anyone needing oxygen of more than five liters to maintain saturation with increased work of breathing or increasing oxygen requirement. Okay. Most patients, despite being distressed, can speak in full sentences. As you can see from them clinically, their work of breathing is increased. Any patient who is hemodynamically unstable, systolic BP of less than 90, or a mean arterial pressure of less than 25, or is tachycardic. Acidosis is definitely an indication, pH of less than 7.3, a CO2 which is going up, or if the lactates are high. Any patient with severe comorbidities or at high risk of deterioration should be referred to ICU early. Let's look at some studies that looked at time cause for progression of hypoxic respiratory failure. Right? They seem to appear very rapidly, within 12 to 24 hours. Now, from the onset of symptoms, medium time to develop ARDS is about 8 to 12 days from the study from uh, Wuhan. And mechanical ventilation was between 10 to 15 days. So, and if you can look at our patient, it was about that time. So, you can see he was referred to ICU about day 8 because he did not need mechanical ventilation. So, day 8 is about the time he, from the time he had his first symptom. How much oxygen do we need? We just need to target a saturation of 93.6%. And we need non humidified oxygen because humidity situation may result in aerosolization. Usually, we start off with nasal cannula. You can go on to simple face mask or nitric mask to temperature the oxygen. So what about the use of non invasive ventilation in hypoxemic respiratory failure? Current guidelines suggest that it is not recommended due to the high failure rate. Right? It's like any other patient with hypoxemic respiratory So the possible risk of aerosolization with poor mask use. Even the rapid progression of disease in this case, patients will be intubated. Why not avoid intubation in this group of patients? Now, I know there are a lot of studies, I think, uh, showing that there may be a role if, if we use NIV, the caveats would include ensuring patient is in a negative pressure room because of the risk of aerosolization, ensuring an adequate seal with the mask with your NIV mask. Patient needs to be monitored closely for worsening respiratory status. You would want to consider early intubation in a controlled setting that means wearing your full PPE and maybe even a PAPR if there is a rapid progressive hypoxia. You do not wait for the patient to worsen too badly. What about the use of high-flow nasal cannula? Now, the two current guidelines by the, the Australians and the SCC guidelines suggest that it is recommended hypoxia associated with COVID-19 disease. However, you have to ensure optimal airborne PPE use. Okay, patients should be preferably in a negative pressure room and monitored closely for NIV so it's not in a setting. Should we have intubated this patient who was extremely tachycardic with respiratory rates of 30 to 35 and a PAO2 of 61, especially if you look at day 3? Well, the reason this patient didn't get intubated was he was very lucid, he was calm, he was not restless and agitated. He was able to use the face mask as an instructor. He was hemodynamically stable. His chest X-rays did not show worsening in his ways, his temperature had settled, and he was being monitored in the ICU. The decision was to intubate him again. And we go on to case study two. This is a gentleman in his 40s, hypertensive, too obese, he had a BMI of 90. Came in on the his uh, his complaint. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. He's a flat so a bit slow, yeah. Okay, sorry, carry on. Okay. He came in, uh, he had his complaint started on the 6th of March with a history of fever, cough, vomiting, running nose, and sore throat. We had him in contact with COVID 19 positive patient. He was admitted three days later to the ward on the 9th. He 
the water was too dry, the tent, the very next day she needed supplemental oxygen to keep maintain his saturation by the sick water. Kindly check with me if his rest rate was about 22 to 24. This is his x-ray on admission to the war. You can see the same bilateral lung infiltrate as the patient that I discussed earlier. Three days later, he was referred to IC on the 12th for hypoxemic respiratory failure. He was extremely short of breath. His rest rate was 40. There was a sudden deterioration over six hours. He was stable, hemodynamic, but extremely breathless and agitated, and he was immediately intubated in the ward in a negative pressure field. So you can see from here, from the 3rd to the 8th, six days of illness, and the 7th and the 10th, he was in the ward, the little ward, and then he was admitted at day 11 of illness to ICU. So he was transferred to ICU following intubation at about 1 p.m. at 12. This was his ventilatory settings that we put him on. He was at a tidal volume of 6 mils per kilo, a vital pressure of less than 30. His weight was between 20 to 22. He had a very high PEEP of 12, FRO2 of 1. His PF ratio was less than 100. This was his x-ray when he was admitted um, on the 13th. 12 uh, to ICU, day one of ICU, as you can, you can see, the infiltrates have progressively worse. He was sedated with fentanyl propofol. Hemodynamically, he remained fairly stable, not needing any vasopressors. His urine output was good, it was 0 0.1 mils per hour, but his PF ratio remained less than 600. He decided to do more than 7 hours. Nine hours of stone, his PF ratio only increased to 450. We phoned him for a total duration of 18 hours. In the ICU, we monitored his input and output very closely to the rhythm of even to negative balance. His renal function did deteriorate with, with, uh, with creatinine increasing up to 332. However, he never required dialysis. By day four, we could wean him off. CPAP with pressure support, it was really good. But after that, it became very difficult to wean because of restlessness and agitation. We had to use you know, a, a lot of sedation on him and antipsychotics to calm him down. We were able to extubate him on day seven, high flow mark, but he would still remain a little bit tachypneic. It was only at day 10 we discharged him to the hospital. By the time we discharged him, his renal function continued to improve and his pressure was down to 220. So this is his, his presentation here. You can see the dry, actually. So you can see another spike of temperature here. He always remains stable, never needing any vasopressors. Intubated on day, on day he came into ICU. Had eating at that point. PF ratio of 93. After phoning him, his PF ratio actually improved and it remained above 200 after that. On CPAP on day four, excavated. This is day five of ICU, and <coughs> he was already changed to CPAP pressure support for about 24 hours. It looks as if he had worsening of his case at this point of the time. He was even fluid over DB, so we can say fluid overloaded, despite the fact that he had really been quite tight in terms of fluid. This is the x-ray taken after we had extubated him on the post-extubation. Still looking quite wet. He was quite tachypneic still at that point. He still kept him quite dry. Um, in terms of antibiotics, when he came in, he was actually starting on He was always continuing on Calypta and uh, Interpron, which was started from the day he was admitted. We had changed him from Capitin to, to Neropenem when we saw the chest x-ray looking on, on day 7 and 8, so we had actually changed antibiotics thinking that it might be a, a, a pneumonia. Liver cultures were all negative. His white cells actually remained normal throughout the stay. This is day 10, sort of improving, and, uh, and by the time we discharged him, uh, this is what the x-ray looks like. 
So what can we learn from this case? I think we all know that these patients go into ARDS and we need to have lung protective strategies and mechanically ventilating these patients. So these are the things we do when we mechanically ventilate these patients. I don't want you for four to eight meals of liquid oxygen for IV. Whether you use pressure control or, or, or volume control, the tidal volume must be kept within four to eight meals. Maintain a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters of water. You would need to have, because we're using such low tidal volume, the initial respiratory rate has to be anywhere between 16 to 20 days to 24 to prevent respiratory acidosis, except permissive hypercapnia in, in these patients. Use a higher PP, anything more than 10. Some places advocate even 15 centimeters of water on the patient. But just be aware that barrel coma is higher PP. Prone position. Now, early proning is advocated for severe ARDS if you find that the PF ratio of less than 150. Generally, it's advocated to prone patients for between 12 to 16 hours. When proning patients, deep sedation is required. Yes. You need to also start continuous neuromuscular process. Now, some practical considerations when you prone patients. Since this, there seems to be a dramatic increase in the oxygenation and PF ratio when prone. Have a protocol for prone position in your ICU so that everyone knows what to do when you need to prone someone. Prone PPE is the use positioning of patient into the prone position. Minimize the risk of accident, accidental extubation and pressure sore by having this protocol. Okay, fluid strategies. The code will advocate prescriptive fluid strategies. So we need to target an even, or maybe even a negative So we need to monitor the input and output extremely closely. Remember, input includes not just your fluid, but the feeding and the volume of antibiotics infused. You may need to use important doses of clozomide just to maintain your, your fluid balance. Give keeping tight fluid balance, monitor renal function 12 hourly. Adjust the dose of drugs, especially antibiotics, if renal function deteriorates. What about ensuring ventilatory uh, symptoms? We know that ventilatory induced lung injury is very common in patients who are not synchronous with the ventilator. So assess for synchrony with the ventilator. Look for signs of wet shaking, double triggering. You can see it on the waveforms of the ventilator, under ventilatory alarm. So we need to titrate your analysis, analysis to, to allow this ventilator synchrony by giving deeper sedation. And in some patients, if deeper sedation does not help, then you would need to have continuous neuromuscular blockade for at least 12 to 24 hours, if not more, even if they are not full. Of course, you've got to rule out other causes of ventilatory synchrony, and this is some of them. Restlessness and agitation. Right, there are many causes of restlessness and agitation. You might have to you know, treat the underlying cause, but use antipsychotics like dopamazine, risperidone can be used to treat restlessness and agitation. Bronchospasm. Sorry, there's a mistake here. You need to use bronchodilators, right? And preferably using uh, meter dose in, uh, inhalers over nebulization. Blocked ECT. Um, I think I have seen a number of blocked ECTs. The reason I think being um, we are not using heated humidifier here in our patients, we need to use a filter. So the ECTs do tend to get blocked, and also they're using closed inline suction. Right? So if the ECT is blocked, you may need to change. Full PPE is changing the ECT. Think about the filter as well. Now we are. As we don't use heated humidifiers, we are only using uh, 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 HMEF, which is a viral filter. Um, you may need to change the filter on a daily basis. When changing, put the ventilator in a standby mode, clamp ECT, because it is an aerosol generating procedure. But remember, caution when clamping ECT, deflation is induced spontaneously from those on CPAP versus the body. 
drug interaction. See, we all need to be aware of, of drug interactions between the drug use and ideas, the sedatives, the analgesics, the propofol, the antihypertensive, on, on all those patients on COVID-19 therapies like Celestra and hydroxychloroquine. So this is a good slide to look at for drug interactions of the drugs that we use and the COVID-19 therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, you're right, there's certainly a lot of uh, learning points that we can take from here. Uh, I wonder whether Yubisha has joined uh, the meeting. Uh, I feel funny asking you, Giri, are you there? Queen E2? Queen E2. Okay, while well, waiting for you to get off, maybe some technical issues. <laughs> Hi, Giri here. Yeah. Yes, Giri, thank you very much. We hear you loud and clear. The word is loud. Um, as I mentioned just now, today's forum is looking at how we can learn how to manage patients better. Uh, I know some of the questions there are related to testing and policies on testing, etc. So perhaps you know, this is not the right forum to, to do this, and uh, the people who can provide that information won't be on this forum anyway. So uh, I apologize. I'm going to move those questions off. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, both. I'm going to ask both Dr. Shanti and Dr. Yiri to to take the questions first. Right. And I'll direct it to either one of them. Uh, perhaps uh, Shanti or Yiri has to go off for a while. Uh, this might be having issues. Um, I'll just read off the second question, for example. There are reports regarding purely non-respiratory system presentations, such as GI symptoms. How should we screen COVID in these cases? Um, perhaps I'll just answer this myself. Is it okay, Shanti? You can end on if you wish. Uh, we all know that uh, most of the symptoms are pretty non-specific. I think fever has been touted as one well, of the more common ones, but really, they are quite varied. Respiratory symptoms, of course, are the ones that we are very aware of. But there have been some cases presenting with GI symptoms, with the signal, diarrhea, and vomiting, even though that's the standard for patients with that. Um, and we know that uh, there can have been cases presenting with diarrhea, even though the number of patients with uh, COVID-19 having diarrhea is certainly significantly less than what we saw in SARS. Uh, clearly, I think it's important currently, if you look at the contact history and travel history, there are still issues with travel history. Of course, now the new the new update of, of uh, COVID now is really in Europe and in the States. Uh, but I think all of us are aware that as more and more community transmission occurs, it will be more difficult. Uh, that is why I think it's important, even though we are on a COVID platform here, to remind our staff at the COVID was to be careful not to take shortcuts as well as PPE and procedures are concerned. I think it's equally important, if not more important, is to remind our colleagues who are working on the non-COVID sector to be equally careful as well. So we have may have to look at it on a much more community-wide uh, basis uh, to protect our healthcare staff. Right, that is all uh, I guess I can say about that. Let's move on, shall we? Uh, okay, we'll skip the testing slide. I just suffice to say, I think we all heard the Dr. KPK mentioning this uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, give the Ministry of Health time, and I think, uh, as expected, uh, we hope that we will see more testing available uh, sometime next week and by April. So we, we hope we can address this uh, in a better way in the weeks to come. So let them work on it. Uh, okay. I'm not sure whether it's fair to ask the question of Shanti or Kiri. For lab technicians exposed to blood specimens of COVID-19, while running specimens via an open method, what is the risk of transmission? Uh, anyone who has any lab person anywhere who wants to answer this question, I, I feel incapable of or not qualified to answer this question. But I think everybody should be working uh, on a biosafety uh, cabinet level, and this should not happen because the risk in the lab is also significant, suffice to say. And if you are working on an open system, I think you do need to talk to your pathology boxes to see how we can address this. Uh, and of course, PPEs are extremely important there. Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay. Uh, so 
Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let's let's move uh, to the next management question. Uh, someone talked about. Uh, of course, we know that hydroxychloroquine has been touted a lot now lately. Uh, we all know that the data is still very preliminary. Uh, perhaps Chucky, I know uh, the Somai Bolo chats have been using a bit of hydroxychloroquine now. Uh, I'm not sure how far it has gone, but certainly I'm sure we have seen some cases. So I was wondering whether you can give some comment about your preliminary experience with hydroxychloroquine in some of the Somai Bolo cases. Um, I think they just had started the use of hydroxychloroquine in, in Somai Bolo. Um, it's really difficult to say. It would be very anecdotal if I because they are not just only on, on hydroxychloroquine, they are also on, by the time they come to IC, they are also on the prime and interferon is also added when they come into IC. Whether they yeah, I, I, hydroxychloroquine or because it's a combination of three or what, I, I, I'm not really sure about that. I can't really see that. Yeah, I, I know I've been unfair to you. Uh, no one can answer that question <laughs> in a clever way at the moment. The only way is to move forward in. Uh, as Anthony Fauci said clearly uh, a couple of days ago, it has to be a randomized controlled trial. But it's challenging times now. We may not always have the setup to do a randomized controlled trial right off the bat. But clearly, I would encourage all the ID, ICU teams around the country who are managing COVID cases, if you are considering using any of these newer medication therapies, document everything you, as much as you can. At least you get a case series of some sort. Uh, and perhaps uh, nationally, uh, we can put together uh, uh, put together a randomized control trial if the drug carries enough promise. Um, so okay, so uh, I'm not going to talk about hydroxychloroquine anymore at the moment because we're really in very very early days. All right. Okay. The question to Shanti: How to excavate this patient? Do you see the question? Yes. Yes, I do. I do. Okay. Uh, just before I go on to excavating the patient, I just wanted to talk about the vitamin C that was also asked just now, uh, the use of vitamin C. Uh, I, I don't think there have been any studies done on the use of vitamin C in these, these patients, so, uh, so maybe not vitamin C yet. There may be studies coming up. With regards to, with regards to extubating of uh, patients, uh, extubation is also considered aerosol generating. So when extubating what is advocated is always a negative therapy, so do and uh, if you do a PAC after that. But in reality, though it's not an extubation yard, and sometimes it's like you have to take it as a room, you just need to wear your full PPE, which means your N95, your machine, everything. And people are getting to be very innovative now on how to extubate these patients because we do not have negative pressure in PAC yard. So a lot of them, if you look up, they're using plastic bags over the patient and other things to, to help during the extubation period. Here in Sunai Bulo, we are using full 3 PCRs because we do have PAC. Shanti, 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 I think uh, what you've said is very important. Uh, unfortunately, I've been told uh, it's not, the audio is not coming very right clearly from your end. If you speak closer to the mic, you don't mind and repeat. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, can you, can okay, you hear uh, me now? Is it better? Yeah, okay. I can hear you better. Uh, my colleagues here, yeah, hearing is not very good. They ask you to speak slower. Okay. Uh, and thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. With regards to, to extubation, okay, how do we extubate our patients here? You know, extubation is an aerosol generating procedure. So it's best to extubate these patients in a negative pressure room uh, with full uh, PPE, including maybe a PAPR. But in, in reality, a lot of places do not have PAPR or even negative pressure room. So I, I would say that when we extubate these patients, we would perhaps extubate them with uh, using full PAPR. Uh, there are some innovative ways where people use uh, you know, a plastic bag you know, a huge plastic bag which is put over the patient. If you look up YouTube, uh, people are trying to create all these uh, uh, innovative ways of how to extubate the patient in a 
since we do not have the APR uh, or negative pressure All right, okay. Uh, all right, thank you. Thanks, Shanti. No, thank you. Uh, Shanti, you have a
shortness of breath, so to speak, um, asking them for exertional shortness of breath, counting respiratory rate for one minute, um, and obviously looking for um, saturation. Um, and, and this patient, in this sort of critical period from day 7 to day 10, um, you'll be having teams seeing them regularly, so this sort of shortness of breath or, or, or deterioration can be picked up early. Um, and this is where uh, communicating with anesthesia colleagues would be really helpful, and most hospitals are doing that, um, so that patients who need um, intubation are intubated in a controlled manner in the ICU, uh, where everybody is in appropriate PPE when intubations are done. Um, and I think this is something we would want to um, educate our younger doctors, um, um, and obviously, particularly in, in, in centers which have experienced managing COVID, I'm sure this is already being done. Right. Okay. Yep, I agree. Yes, I agree. Uh, okay. Uh, hear me? Hear me? Apparently, they, uh, hear me? They, apparently they lost a bit of your, your, your answer. Could you okay. Quick, quick one summarize? Okay. Um, so we know from experience now, or we know from literature now, that patients deteriorate um, after the first week of illness, um, and this is where perhaps um, centers which are managing patients with COVID um, look more uh, for symptoms of deterioration. For example, exertional shortness of breath. Um, objectively counting respiratory rate for one minute and obviously looking at saturation. And this is the time you probably want to do reviews a bit more regularly. So patients with deteriorate are picked up early um, and managed in the appropriate care well early on so there's no sort of crash intubation that has to be done in the ward. So you want to get these patients to ICU early so that you know, your patients are intubated in a proper manner they need to be intubated. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Yuri. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. All right. Uh, the next question is, if a SARI patient is first tested negative for COVID, but continues to show patterns of decreasing ALT, increasing CRP, and the like, uh, is there a role for repeat tests for COVID? Um, Any one of you? Uh, Shanti? There probably is a, I think there's a, probably a, a, a goal for all these test. It depends on the, it depends at, at what age he has come in as well and things like that. So perhaps a repeat test, you know, will just confirm things because he would be worried if, if he, he actually deteriorates into that. I'm quite sure. Yuri, what do you think? It's all good for Sari patients? Yeah, that's right. Important is, I mean, basically here you're having patients who have acute respiratory illness with a sort of unknown diagnosis, so to speak. Um, and if you have a diagnosis which is established and the patient is getting better, and then you have a negative result, that's more reassuring. But if the patient continues to deteriorate um, and you don't have a diagnosis, I will definitely be a, a, a test. I, my opinion would be yes, I would consider doing a repeat because as we know, uh, testing is 700% depends how the, the sample was taken. Uh, and clearly, I think in the process of a few days of medication, and we still haven't found an alternative diagnosis, and, and the picture continues to fit what we see in COVID, I think that that specimen should be repeated. Right. Okay. Uh, a quick question on data interferon. Uh, I know that locally we have combined uh, interferon together with Elytra. Uh, perhaps uh, Yuri uh, or Shanti, both of you, uh, what are your opinion about continuing using data interferon? I think the evidence for any of the drug use currently is not very strong, but uh, we are using uh, hope that it will help. I, I don't think the evidence is uh, very strong in this field. Have you all seen any uh, significant adverse effects from using data interferon thus far? No, not not yet.
yet. But you know, because they are on a whole lot of other drugs as well for us, they are on Caletra and they are on um, hydroxychloroquine. It's difficult to really say if they are telling you precisely. Yeah. I think that's probably the whatever we try now, we all know that we don't have strong evidence. Um, but the evidence will get stronger over time. I know Kalitra's light has become dimmer uh, because of some studies showing that it did not make that much of a difference. Um, among ID people, we are very comfortable with Kalitra. We have used it for tons and tons of it. So I guess we know what to predict, what, we, what can go wrong. And maybe the fear of it as well has been in our armamentarium for quite some time. We know how to use it and what we expect to find in terms of side effects. But I think um, until better drugs come along, I can understand for patients who are not doing well, you know, we literally throw everything at them. Uh, but let's hope, we let's hope we continue to collect data so that over time uh, we have some documentation of how our treatments are going. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, uh, this is the... Uh, oh yes, anonymous. Okay. Um, now, we all know that. Yes, yes, you have a question on the use of LMA. Somebody asked a question on LMA for, for the purpose of COVID. What is the question? LMA is the Oh, okay. Yeah. Shanti, obviously. I'm not sure the use of LMA in in, in, in what context. I, I didn't really see the question, but uh, yeah. No, I think I think most of the time, I mean, if you really can't intubate a patient, that's why it must be the best person intubating a video laryngoscope, preferably to be available uh, to intubate the patient. Uh, Will then not be use a, a, an LMA because if you use an LMA to intubate, uh, to ventilate the patient, you still have to come up with an NE on the at the end of the day. So if an LMA is used and you have to bag the patient, you, think you will have to use a viral sinker together with your your bag mouth mask to to slowly bag the patient because it's only going to be aerosol generated. Put in a, a I mean, then uh, we got to. Uh, yeah, I think if you you put in an an LME, then you you it is going to be difficult. I think uh, to after that you have to think about how are you going to secure the airway if, even if you put in an LME. Are you going to take him to theatre at that point of time, or what are we going to do? So your your next step needs to be there as well. Okay. Um, okay, Shanti. Um, this is addressed to you, so my job is minimal here. Uh, when will be the optimal time to start Kalitra and interferon? I, I know that this are started by the ID people. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, actually, um, all our patients come from the ward with Kalitra and interferon. By the time they come to us, they have had three or four days of Kalitra and interferon already. Um, so they are starting it, at, I believe, at the seven day eight of, of illness, or if they see somebody who is deteriorating. Am I right, Giri? I think Giri would be a better person to ask this question. Yeah, Giri, please, your, please tell us our, our levels of care. Go ahead, Giri. Um, so, so I think what, what we are trying to do from an ID perspective is categorize these patients. Um, so there's several categories. So category one is just basically an asymptomatic patient. Category two, mildly symptomatic. Category three, uh, they're symptomatic with pneumonia uh, uh, without oxygen requirement. Category four, with oxygen requirement. And category five, then ICU care. Um, so uh, what this, this, is, this is based on what we know at the moment. Obviously, things might change as we learn more about the disease and learn more about therapies that come on. Um, so at the moment, what we do is for patients with Category 2, for example, they're mildly symptomatic, we tend to try start hydroxychloroquine. For patients with Category 3 with a pneumonia, if they have 
persistent fever or dropping uh, absolute lymphocyte count, um, we add on Caletra. Um, and obviously in category 4, I already on Caletra. And if they need ICU care, uh, they are put at either interferon or, or ribavirin. But I have to be, again, um, be absolutely um, clear here. This is based on a lot of anecdotal evidence from, um, the, from SARS and from MERS. Um, and it's not randomized control trial evidence as we have at the moment. Um, so this is what we are doing at the moment. Things might change. In fact, as soon as next week, if you have better better trial information. So um, so I'll just, you know, let everybody know from a clinician perspective, just keep up to date in, in therapy because things change so fast and, and, and therapies might long line change as well. Uh, right, thank you, uh, Yuri. Um, there are 99 or more now questions, so uh, I'm going to take the liberty as a moderator to, to run through or avoid some of them, not because we want to answer just too many, all right? Uh, there was one question just now about using nebulization uh, for patients uh, with COVID. I'll just quickly answer Dr. Shanti has mentioned, uh, try very hard not to use nebulizer, obviously, because it's uh, aerosolization of of, uh, of the bus, uh, clearly use an MDI whenever possible. Okay, uh, the question just now, you very come. Okay, the, the, the question was the, uh, for patients with COVID, or what is the, the concern about transaminitis, for example, uh, did you see cases that uh, they have been high or raised liver enzymes? Uh, maybe Erika. Uh, all right. So it's not a common problem if we see for patients who are sort of asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic. That that's a given. I think most large majority of patients are asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic. Um, then you have the patients who are critically ill. Um, and by then, they're probably on a whole load of medications, which also can cause transaminitis. Um, so we do see patients who are critically ill with transaminitis, um, but it's usually because of a multitude of factors. Um, we know the, the fact that some of them, because of, for example, have a syndrome which is beginning to be recognized as a cytokine relief syndrome, which can cause a whole multitude of organ failure, transaminitis, AKI, and things like that. Um, so, trying to discern, discern um, this disease-related patterns from drugs with cross um uh, is difficult sometimes. Um, so, yes, we do see, and yes, it's usually in the patients who are more ill um, requiring ICU care. Um, not so much in the patients who are asymptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay, uh, so just quickly recap what Yuri has said. Um, COVID or the SARS-CoV-2 now, uh, it's not a, uh, a bug that particularly just attacks the liver. Uh, and if the liver involvement is there and we raise trans transaminitis, we will have to think of maybe some of the drugs that we have given, perhaps. Plus, as part of a multi-organ issue, a later part of illness and everything actually goes up. So if you, someone comes in, and only has raised trans and nitrous and nothing else, um, COVID-19 may not be the first thing you think about. Now, I'm going to ask, um, ask two of the questions here. Uh, I'm sorry I'm picking up because there's just so many of them. Um, how, yeah, 104 questions now. How long are the patients considered infective? I know our guidelines have addressed that, but maybe Dr. Geary can give us uh, some, some update. Uh, have you extubated any patients who are still considered infected? The answer is yes. Uh, Dr. Shanti has done that. And the clearance of the infection actually goes back to the general ward, which is uh, covered by the IU position. Uh, so, Gary, can you answer the question? How long are the patients considered infected? So, the evidence for this, I think, is um, you're looking at two groups of people. Um, I, I know our um, guidelines have, have talked about, uh, about this in particular, but what we know from, from studies which have been published, patients who are sort of mild, who have mild illness, are usually less infected 
and usually up basically up to ten days, and they usually they clear viruses. Uh, patients who are more ill, uh, shed perhaps they look have viruses for a longer period. But generally, what we look at is um, patients who are clinically better, uh, who have two viral, uh, who have two PCR which are negative. Um, we are quite comfortable discharging them with a, probably a further 14 days at home being monitored um, under home surveillance. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's for our <coughs> current guidelines. Um, so, yeah, the question actually. Um, it's with, I think there are one or two questions on, on chest x-rays. Do they need to be clear before we discharge them from ICU? I think the, the, the x-ray findings uh, um, lag behind your clinical findings. So just go clinically. Uh, if the patient, you know, for patient to be discharged from ICU, even if the x-ray doesn't look, you know, very, very clear, but clinically, the patient is stable, the patient is not tachypneic, oxygenation is good. I think uh, it's fairly safe to discharge this patient from ICU. The ID team will then continue to monitor the patient in the ward and discharge them, you know, at, 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 at an appropriate time. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, Chad, uh, there's a question. I, I think in your slides you may have uh, answered it, but since someone asked it, uh, for patients with oxygenation failure, what is the highest flow of O2 that can be allowed via high flow oxygen mask? Uh, okay, that, I think I, I'm not sure whether the uh, high flow oxygen, we usually use about, about 10 litres. Most are a bit circumspect about using more than, in fact, 6 litres, saying that anything more than 6 could cause aerosolization. But um, 6 litres is just too low, so we tend to use about up to 10, 10 litres. Of oxygen, patients at high flow. Okay, thank you, thank you, Shanti. Uh, can we move up? Uh, yeah, go up. Uh, here's a question to Shanti, and I understand because the intubation is always. Uh, uh, risky procedure for, for the staff. But the question is, uh, I'm going to read it. Hi, Dr. Shanti. Any strict infection measure in your experience managing COVID patients? Uh, is it different compared to other hospitals? Uh, what is being practiced now in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur? Shanti. Yeah, I think um, most places, yeah, I, we know that infection control is extreme importance when managing these patients with COVID. So it has to be full PPE and all the donning and doffing of PPE should have been done prior to this. That means your infection control link nurse should have come up to you to go through the steps of donning and doffing of PPE. I think that's extremely important. So in our hospital, when I was in HKL, we went through these steps a couple of times to ensure that everyone knows how to don and doff. And then remind them when they are reviewing patients who are COVID positive in the ICU, they also need to wear their full PPE, remembering how to don again before going in and doff. I think that's extremely important. There needs to be enhanced uh, a cleaning of, of your, all these high touch areas aware of little, little things when you are in the ICU, such as, you know, the pens that are used, so please keep it for one particular patient, we don't share these things. So they are small but important things uh, when you are talking about infection control. They are small but many things that you have to remember when you are talking about infection control in the ICU. It's easy if you have a negative pressure room or a single room with an empty room, but if you are managing COVID patients in an open ICU, it, it, it's a little bit more different. So you have to be very careful about infection control. You must care, take care of your healthcare workers as well. Uh, thanks, Shanti. I, I'm going to add a little bit since we brought up the issue of infection control and, and the staffing. Uh, I think all the heads of service uh, in their, at the respective hospitals would agree with me. At the end of the day, uh, it's how the guidelines are there. Uh, and most times, the, all the PPEs we need are there. Uh, but the weakest link is also how well we comply with it. Uh, the 
reality is this, uh, there's a lot of young doctors um, are being sent into COVID wards uh, because it's affecting the entire country. Uh, and uh, I think all of us have concerns about that. Uh, so I think it's important for the heads of service, uh, various sectors, especially in the general ward, to spend a lot of time to make sure our junior officers are able to comply and are taught how to comply because it takes just one person to get infected and the next group of people that he or she infects will be the one in their family and the two, their colleagues that are working with them. This we learned in SARS. Uh, as Dr. Kriti K mentioned yesterday or today, uh, out of the, all the patients, all the healthcare workers who have been infected, they have been infected either through their social activities, going for kanduri and weddings, and also infecting each other in their own hospitals. I think we must not take it lightly. Uh, this is something we have to be aware of. But my fear is this. We are only in a couple of months of, of COVID-19. Over the next few weeks or months, our staff will end up two, with two possibilities. Number one, getting fatigued and tired. Therefore, they take things for granted. Things that were important to them initially become less important to them because they do it every single day. And they may see nothing happening, and therefore, we all might get a bit nonchalant. The other thing is, as things get worse, uh, they get uh, uh, scared and therefore uh, uh, not willing to work in, in, the, in the hospitals in the setting. So I think it is important, therefore, the leaders on the ground, and, and I'm sure many of them are listening today, I think we must make sure we play our role as leaders uh, and, and maintain their morale, maintain their confidence in doing this. Otherwise, you know, infection control is only as good as what is on the paper. What's the point? Okay, that was my little speech and my sermon. Sorry about that. Let's move on. Uh, I think the next few questions Shanti has already answered, so I won't repeat that. You don't have to wait for check X-ray clearance for this chart. Uh, the main thing is the two negative uh, samples 24 hours apart. Now, this question I want to bring up because uh, there's some form of testing available. As we know, our diagnosis is based on the real-time PCR test, which is a lab-based test. Now, uh, some kits, some new kits are coming in now. I think that's what DG has mentioned it, but give them time to look at it and to implement it. But currently, the rapid test that's available in the private side generally, at the moment, are generally serology tests. Therefore, they look at IgG and IgM. The question here is, if patients are IgG and IgM positive for COVID-19 uh, and are asymptomatic, are they safe for discharge and home quarantine? Uh, number one, I think Dr. Giri, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we are not checking for IgG, IgM at the hospital level, so we don't have this problem with that. But maybe you can just quickly talk about uh, serology testing, uh, Yiri. Um, yes, Dato. I mean, obviously, I agree with you. Um, so what what we're trying to do for more for, for at the moment at least is getting patients tested, knowing that they are probably infected and will be able to have onward transmission, and get them isolated as soon as possible. Um, and IgG, IgM, um, unfortunately, does not help in this at the moment yet. Um, and number two, I think we, the IgG, IgM tests have to have a bit more validation um, and widespread sort of studies to show that it works before it can be commercially used, actually, at least in clinical practice in hospitals to begin with. Um, so at the moment, we, we strongly recommend that you have a patient you're suspecting that has um, COVID-19 um, get them to a testing center, let them get um, PCR test done, the RT-PCR done, um, and then see how, how we go from uh, then manage them from there. Um, yeah, that would be my take on that. Good. Quickly, thanks. Quickly to the next question. Uh, we mustn't let our detective colleagues feel less alone. I apologize. Uh, how about the use of Kalitra interferon in pediatric population? So I know Dr. Shanti and uh, Dr. Giri may have not too much to say about it, but uh, any pediatrician out there who... Do you have Dr. T speaking here? I, I, I saw him, but I didn't want to call him out, my old friend. Hey, how are you? I found it out. Don't, next, time, next time, don't sit in front. Sit at the back. They cannot see you. <laughs> okay, do you mind, please? Uh, th 
thanks, Dr. Um, the, the majority of uh, the pediatric uh, admission so far has been quite uh, asymptomatic, and uh, most of it is actually not related to the underlying infection per se. And uh, hence, I think the use of cholesterol and interferon in this population is actually what, first not warranted. Even if they develop symptoms, I think uh, there is uh, very minimal data in the uh, literature now regarding its use. Uh, most of it is actually in the adult population. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's why you see Dr. Steve is still looking very young and very relaxed. <laughs> uh, keep, that, keep it that way. Uh, but he's obviously right, the Kalitra interferon, even in the adult population, is it, it's still anecdotal in, in my mind. And for Pete, uh, because of the number of genetic cases, it's so much less, uh, the experience is even less. Let's hope it remains that way. Okay, let's uh, move up. Can we move on to questions? If there are any burning questions you want to put in now, that's a good time because we might wrap things up in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, all right? Uh, okay, uh, from here about TRP, something that we do frequently nowadays, uh, you know it's not specific, but uh, Dr. Shanti, uh, how do you use TRP in regards to COVID-19 uh, disease severity? I think we, we, we know that Increasing CRP levels is associated with uh, a further process. Um, a increased severity of the injury, of lung injury. So you, you start monitoring uh, your CRP. I mean, if you have the baseline and you see it increasing, uh, then you should be aware. It may be due to a secondary infection, so look out for secondary infection. But just don't use procalcitonin CRP alone to decide to start antibiotics, look at all the other clinical parameters, blood pressures, white cells, if you look for chest x-ray findings, if there's anything in chest x-ray to start, you know, antibiotics, then, and if so, what are the common uh, organisms in your ICU uh, before you start your antibiotics? Uh, thank you, Shanti. Uh, I think there is also another strong point that uh, in there was highlighted in the two cases that Shanti presented just now. I think earlier ICU intervention, the chances of patients getting out of ICU early is also better. Uh, you know that we all, with respect to Shanti, stay too long in ICU is not a good thing, and obviously we collect other bugs as well. So I think getting in early and getting out fast might be a better strategy if it's possible. I'm going to ask, answer three questions here. Uh, uh, and Dr. Kiwi can take this one. Do you have do we have any guideline on occupational injury to COVID related uh, sorry, occupational exposure due to COVID? I think yes, you're talking about sharp injuries, all right? Uh Kiwi? We we definitely have for patients who have um uh, exposure from a from a, for example uh, being in close vicinity for a patient who had an aerosolized procedure, healthcare workers are stratified uh, based on the risk of exposure, whether they're high, medium, or low risk. So for for occupational exposure for needle stick injuries related, um, what happens would be the same thing. As, I mean, performing procedures is obviously with universal precaution. Um, and then you added a precaution because uh, patients with COVID-19 um, are, are, are with enhanced PPE and, and N95 masks we see these patients. So when there is a needle stick injury, again what happens is there will be an occupational risk assessment um, and depending on what is the possible risk for both the patient and the healthcare worker, um, it will appropriately be addressed at the occupational health level in individual hospitals. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Giri. That's all. Can I just intervene? There were a couple of questions relating to medical COVID, neonatal transmission, and such. Uh, can I get uh, both of them here to answer that since they have some experience? Okay. Sure. Um, so, I mean, for, for, me, for me personally here, at least in, uh, in, in Sabah, we don't have experience as of yet. But if you look at literature, what has been said is um, the transmission is usually not a perinatural transmission. But usually because of close contact after the mother has been with the baby, um, 
after delivery. Um, and even then, that's a small number of uh, uh, cases which have been reported. Um, so I think we're still learning about uh, uh, transmission in, in this group of uh, patients. But as as of we know, um, there's no uh, as now as we know now as information we know for now, um, there's no strong correlation for perinatal transmission, and it's more because after that, um, the baby is born and is close contact with a uh, person which is positive for COVID-19. Uh, okay. Can I just add on? Yeah, the Sumer Bulo team, they have some experience uh, with Dr. Uh, hi, uh, th thank you, uh, Dato. So, um, Sumer Bulo is the uh, designated um, hospital to uh, accept uh, mothers with COVID positive and uh, who are pregnant. So, we do have a consensus among the uh, obstetricians and also the new neonatologists on what is the uh, perinatal management and also the postnatal management. Uh, there's only been one reported case of vertical transmission from the Chinese cohort, which uh, wasn't very clear on whether it was, you know, uh, acquired actually perinatally or actually the true horizontal transmission postnatally. Uh, anyway, in uh, Sungai Bolo at the moment, uh, most of it is actually done through cesarean section. Uh, this is the agreement by the uh, obstetric team. And uh, if the mother is already in advanced stages of labor, then full PPE, including PAR, must be used during the delivery. And uh, so far, uh, all deliveries have been uh, okay, and there's no neonatal uh, uh, who, neonate who has actually got the uh, infection postnatally. And uh, in our cohort, uh, we are actually uh, at the moment uh, keeping the babies away from the breast milk and uh, isolating them from the mother. This is in contrast to some of the other guidelines which are found, uh, especially in the RCTPCH, which actually allows some forms of skin-to-skin uh, -skin and also uh, breast milk. So uh, at the moment, um, as far as we, we know, that the uh, placental swabs and also the, uh, what do you call it, the breast milk swabs has been negative. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, any of the obstetricians there? Or? Uh, no, no, at the moment, no. Okay, all right. Okay, okay uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, let, let's hope there are not that many pregnant mothers with COVID, but yeah, it might come. Okay, I'm going to wrap things up pretty soon. Uh, there are a lot of questions here. The questions are really getting hot now, but uh, I'll just try to address two before we call it a day. Uh, what sorry patients are screened for COVID? Now, uh, in the past, uh, sorry, we had a sorry surveillance, so not every sorry was was tested because we felt uh, initially Ministry of Health felt that there were not uh, just because they want to detect whether there were any unlinked cases. So uh, they were testing was done by surveillance. But now uh, sorry patients are being provided testing. Now if testing is not yet fully acceptable or fully or easily available, do we select what type of sorry patients should be screened for COVID? And let's get it very be clear. I'm all for screening everybody with, with, with sorry, surely, no question. But in case we do not have enough tests, let's say uh, we still cannot fulfill that need, what type of sorry patients would be screened for COVID? Perhaps uh, Dr. Giri, sir? You went for lunch. Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are here. Okay. Carry on. All right. All right. So, I mean, I think for study patients would be basically, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. So, um, we would like, we would obviously like to screen more study patients, or all study patients for, for COVID-19. Uh, but I think for, for practical purposes, um, We'll have to look at sorry cases which does not have a good explanation of what the condition is caused by. That would be one. Um, you also want to look at um, links to clusters which perhaps you know but don't fall under the category of PUI. And number three, healthcare workers. That means implications when it comes to healthcare workers. If a case um, is not sort of it's unclear, and you have people exposed, you would really want to know what the diagnosis for that particular patient is, and that particular patient is, in, obviously, you want to screen. Uh, but 
moving on, I think, uh, the, when, once you start losing the epidemiological link for, for, for patients with PUI, uh, this is where you, you sort of want to look at the side cases a little harder. You want to know what your heart spots a little better. Um, and possibly, if possible, I think hospitals should have um, sort of pneumonia wards or pneumonia cubicles um, where there's enhanced precaution uh, PPE-wise uh, for healthcare workers when these patients come in. Um, and then if they're not getting better for 24 or 48 hours, these patients probably have to be, uh, and don't have a good diagnosis, you want to look at what else there's there and that's probably why you want to screen them for COVID-19 as well. I think there should be a concentrated effort for most hospitals to have wards where you can put patients with pneumonia together and healthcare workers who are taking care of these patients with pneumonia uh, have enhanced PPE to this ward, uh, being uh, a gown, um, gloves, a mask, and, and perhaps a face shield. And if, if they're doing aerosol generating procedures in this particular ward, perhaps you won't look at wearing N95 mask at, at, at that point. Uh, quickly, uh, Iri, can you address the, the, you are seeing the question? They obviously looking in from the white count and the lymphocyte count. Can you quickly give a quick answer to that? Uh, so usually, patients who come in from the community who have a viral like pneumonia, that means who have a low total white, a low absolute lymphocyte count, those are patients you absolutely want to look at, um, uh, even if they don't have a link to any particular clusters, um, those are patients you absolutely look at and um, do uh, COVID-19 testing for them. Okay, all right, thanks, thanks. We're going to move on now. Uh, I'm being careful here because I might be taking the last question. So, uh, right. Okay, the same question comes up. Can we go up quickly? Let's take one more.